Just before we dive in today, got a huge shout out to our sponsor, Conflict of Nations. Have you ever wanted to lead your own country to victory in modern global warfare? Well, I mean, well, probably not in real life, but that's where Conflict of Nations comes in. A free online PvP strategy game where you're not just playing, you are dominating. Conflict of Nations lets you choose a real country, build your army, and engage in battles that can last for weeks. Tanks, jets, nuclear submarines, you name it, you command it. And the best part, you can declare war on your neighbors or form alliances with other players. It's like a global chess game, but with way cooler pieces. You've got complete freedom to shape your own strategy. Whether you're into long-term planning, PvP showdowns, or real-time action, Conflict of Nations has got you covered. And you can seamlessly switch between PC and mobile. Click on the link below to get 13,000 gold and a free one-month premium subscription. It's only available for the next 30 days, so don't miss out. And now, let's get into today's video. It's no secret that North Korea is one of the strangest countries on the entire planet. An isolated dictatorship with some of the most secured borders ever made, it's incredibly difficult to get into and even harder to get out of. Decades of separation from the rest of the world and living under the thumb of an intense authoritarian regime have led to the nation being the home of some of the weirdest laws, customs, and traditions. And today, we're going to dive beyond the absurd propaganda and take a look at the peculiar world of North Korea that manages to be both comical and at the same time tragic. Our first order of business is the absurd history and absolute authority of the country's line of leaders, the Kim family. Upon founding the DPRK in 1948, Kim Il-sung was elected the first supreme leader of the nation due to his popularity as a resistance guerrilla fighter in World War II. He would remain the supreme leader until his death in 1994, and throughout his life, his public image slowly warped from that of a mere mortal into what could literally be considered deity. For example, did you know that North Korea has its own calendar based on the birth date of Kim Il-sung? It's called the Juche calendar, and year one, or Juche one, is 1912. There are no numbers before Juche one, so the Gregorian calendar is used for those, but this issue doesn't come up that often, as North Korea isn't exactly known for teaching extensive history. After Kim Il-sung, power was handed off to his eldest son, Kim Jong-il, and things just kept getting stranger. Reputable sources around the world claim Kim Jong-il was born in the Soviet Union in 1940 but North Korean sources claim that he was actually born in 1941 in a secret military base on Baikdu Mountain, a site historically considered sacred in Korea. Not only that, but his birth was apparently accompanied by a double rainbow, winter spontaneously changing into spring, and a new star shining in the heavens. And not only did Kim Jong-il have a birth reminiscent of Jesus himself, he then apparently went on to be the most intelligent and talented person in the history of the world. They claim that he learned to walk at the age of three weeks and spoke fluently at eight weeks. During his years at Kim Il-sung University, he allegedly wrote 1,500 books and six entire operas, which according to his official biography, are the best pieces of music in all of history. And not only was he an intellectual titan, but also a sports star. When he picked up a golf club for the first time, he shot a 38 under par on North Korea's golf course. To achieve this, he scored a record 11 holes in one, an unbelievable feat, but it must be true because his 17 bodyguards all absolutely confirmed that this definitely happened. And that doesn't even touch on his fashion style, which was reportedly studied around the world, or his claim to have invented the hamburger. Despite being larger than life, however, he was actually quite short, just 5 foot 3 or 160 centimeters, and it seems that he was pretty self-conscious about this. He allegedly only hired bodyguards that were shorter than him, and in a ridiculous effort to increase the average height in his country, is even rumored once to have distributed pamphlets around Pyongyang advertising a miracle height drug. Anyone who responded to the pamphlet was reportedly deemed short, arrested, and sent to a labor camp. It's also Kim Jong-il that's responsible for much of the dangerous modern rhetoric around the North Korean military. For instance, in late 1993, tensions were high as North Korea was considering withdrawing from the non-nuclear proliferation treaty. In the face of a possible war breaking out, Kim Il-sung called all his generals to a meeting where he posed the question, the American scoundrels are about to start a war against us. Will we be able to defeat them? Every general answered with an enthusiastic, propagandistic yes, with quotes arising such as, in a single breath, we will rush to the south, drive out the American imperialists, and unify the fatherland. But Kim Il-sung didn't seem satisfied with the answer, as one question still remains. He then asked, but what if we lose? What shall we do if we lose? 
His generals were taken aback. Never before had they considered the possibility of total defeat, and they certainly didn't expect to hear it from their supreme leader. And that's when his eldest son, the soon-to-be ruler of the DPRK, Kim Jong-il, stood up and said, Great leader, I will be sure to destroy the Earth. What good is this Earth without North Korea? Now, what's interesting is that with all the goofy legends surrounding Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, you'd expect the current leader, Kim Jong-un, to have a similarly hilarious level of mythology, but he just doesn't. For instance, his birthday was on January the 8th, but there were no celebrations in the country whatsoever, unlike the birthdays of his late father and grandfather, which are some of the biggest holidays in all of North Korea, and are often accompanied by huge military parades. Even North Korean state news didn't mention the occasion, with their news that day instead talking about some of his upcoming construction projects and that he visited a chicken farm with his daughter. There is some speculation as to why he hasn't achieved the same level of respect as his predecessors. The first is that he simply hasn't had any major life accomplishments, such as Kim Il-sung being a guerrilla fighter against the Japanese. In fact, Kim Jong-un hasn't really done much during his time as supreme leader. The other theory is that he avoids celebrating his birthday because it might draw attention to the fact that his mother is actually Japanese. This fact became a state secret, and perhaps the lack of celebrations is to make sure that it stays that way, otherwise the legitimacy of his bloodline could be undermined. The outlandish propaganda and strict borders are both part of the greater attempt by the North Korean government to control every aspect of their citizens' lives, and they go to some ridiculous lengths to achieve this. Perhaps the most absurd are the haircut enforcements. It's long been reported that North Koreans have the option to choose from 28 state-sanctioned haircuts and that any others can result in punishment. Recently, mullets were specifically banned, which is very on-brand, considering North Korean officials have long preached against men having long hair. In 2009, a series was broadcast on state TV called Let Us Trim Our Hair in Accordance with Socialist Lifestyle, where they talked about the benefits of men having shorter hair, such as maintaining their spirit and conserving your body bodily energy because, according to them, longer hair consumes your body's precious nutrients. Because of course it does. In fact, that same TV series went on to broadcast the names and ID numbers of individuals in Pyongyang who had let their hair grow too long in hopes of shaming them into trimming it back to orthodoxy. And it's not just hair. Other forms of appearance control include clothing. Jeans, for example, are seen as the epitome of Western capitalistic ideals and therefore are banned, as are short skirts, tight pants, branded t-shirts, nose piercings, and funnily enough, leather trench coats, as it may be seen as an <laughs> imitation of Kim Jong-un's fashion. When this information first began spreading, a few media outlets pushed back on it and stated that while the law might technically forbid certain styles, the enforcement for these exact hairdos didn't seem to be very strong. However, that has changed in recent years as the government has stepped up their enforcement, even going so far as creating a sort of fashion police to crack down on it. These fashion police are often comprised of university students whose job it is to snitch on their classmates. Apart from their appearances, the government also heavily restricts what entertainment and media may be available to the public. Obviously, your standard Hollywood hits aren't going to be allowed, so North Korea produces their own domestic films through the Motion Picture and Arts Division of their Propaganda and Agitation Department. Kim Jong-il became the director of this department in 1966, but was quickly getting frustrated with the films he was producing in the early 70s, which he thought were rather dull, especially compared to Western films. Now, clearly, the problem couldn't be with the divine director or his script, so his diagnosis was that the issue was solely with the actors and actresses who weren't putting forth enough effort. In a 1983 recording, he said that the real problem was that North Korean actors knew that they would be fed by the state no matter how they performed, while South Korean actors put their blood, sweat, and tears into their work to ensure their job security. It seems he was right on the verge of realizing that actors in a free democracy tend to like their jobs more than those who are forced into the industry under an authoritarian regime, but he didn't quite catch the point. Also, he refused to simply show Western films, as in his words, if we continually show Western films on television, show them without restraint, then only nihilistic thoughts can come about. Patriotism, patriotism, patriotism. And finally, his dream was not only to have his films be popular in North Korea, but to become critically acclaimed worldwide. It is a bit ironic to condemn the Western world and their way of life but still seek their validation, but I guess we'll just have to look past that. Get his films popular in the international scene, he needed a fresh perspective, and he knew just how to get it, by kidnapping South Korean film directors to fix his films for him. 
First, North Korean agents in Hong Kong abducted Choi Yung Hee, a popular South Korean actress. Then they nabbed her ex-husband and film director Shin Sang Ok. The two were imprisoned in North Korea until they were brought to a private dinner with Kim Jong Il, where he announced his grand plans for the two. They were brought to his personal cinema, which had 15,000 movies from around the world and were forced to watch and critique four to five every day. Eventually, Kim brought them into his directing and acting team, and the couple went on to produce six films for him, most of which depicted life and resistance during the Japanese occupation of China or Korea and were heavy on the pro-communist themes. Well, except their final film was Pulgasari, an odd Godzilla-inspired tale which ends with the monster accidentally eating a small girl and then exploding. Despite Kim's best efforts, these films also failed to take off internationally, only winning a couple of awards from other communist countries. There's a happy ending, though, as the two did manage to escape to a US embassy during a trip to Vienna. Perhaps the brightest moment in the DPRK's film history came in 2005 with the release of the animated film Empress Chung, which was co-produced with South Korea and released in both nations as a sign of improving relations. Beyond this cartoon, any form of entertainment must be produced in North Korea or there are severe punishments. If parents are caught showing the material to their children, they will go to a labor camp for six months, and the child will go for five years. And if you're caught selling or distributing, the punishment can go all the way to death, a penalty which the government showed they weren't afraid to hand out when in 2022 they executed two teenagers who were caught trying to sell Western media on a flash drive. And this public execution really brings home the tragedy of the current circumstances, because while all of these ridiculous antics and laughable propaganda are undeniably hilarious to anyone outside the country, of course, the citizens of North Korea don't have the luxury of mocking it in a YouTube video like we do. Any form of insult to the supreme leader or his family can result in immediate imprisonment in a labor camp or a death sentence. And not just for the jokester, but for his entire family as well. North Korea's primary strategy to ensure societal control is the constant threat of collective punishment. Someone who might consider breaking the law will think twice when they remember that not only the criminal, but also their whole family will go to prison as a result. And the worst offenders, defectors, have to live with the guilt that any family they left behind will pay the price for their escape. And that's the end of today's video. Just a quick reminder at the end here to check out Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game happening in modern global warfare. Grab your exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and a month premium subscription for free. Offer available only for 30 days. Click that link below and I'll catch you on the battlefield.